Yes. The, the the discussion today is really about the awareness of APIs and, and how we use them at the library, exactly what Mark said. Um, I've been in technology for the last maybe about 10 to 15 years and APIs has really ramped up quite significantly. I don't think we'd be able to provide the solutions that we have today without APIs. Um, but I guess a part of the awareness of APIs is seeing what staff perceptions of APIs are. So just quickly, I went to some samples um, staff around the library just to see if they knew what APIs were. The first one is hit the mark pretty closely. It's a um, means of querying a database using a language provided by a vendor, so that, that's not too bad. Um, and please, all the staff are happy to also share these, these <laughs> thoughts. They are anonymous. Um, the next is no idea, so that's quite common. Um, if you haven't played with APIs or if you even haven't heard of the acronym, um, you probably wouldn't know what it means. Advanced something interface, they got one of the words right in the acronym. Um, yeah, that's a funny one. The next one's a, they thought it was a private investigator. And um, the next one is an interface a user interacts with, like a graphical user interface. So there is an interface interaction that happens with APIs, so they were pretty close with that one. And I'll leave the last one with you. It's so in search of a, an official definition, I looked up Wikipedia. Um, and Wikipedia uh, defines it as an API is an application programming interface. Um, and it's a set of subroutine definitions, protocols, and tools for building application software. So that is a very tech-heavy type definition. Um, next, I thought Google might be a bit better with its definition. Um, and it actually was. It's a bit clearer. So it's again, it's from the computing background. Um, and it's a set of functions and procedures that allow the creation of applications which access the features of, da of data of an operating system, application, or other service. So is it slowly making a bit more sense? But um, I think that th there's still a lot of us that don't understand what that means in our context. So for us, um, when, when we talk about APIs, and probably more sort of in the digital experience area, it's about um, web APIs. Because APIs started more than maybe 20, 30 years ago, but these days, APIs are so pervasive, and they mostly mean web APIs. And the, the, the key words here, I guess, it's a mechanism for applications to speak with each other for a defined purpose. So it's about how they speak to each other and what type of content they have to speak to each other. But why do we need APIs? Because we have a huge range of products and software here at the library. I mean, with a website project, we uh, we've implemented Drupal, Drupal with all these integrations to Gigia, which is our um, identity provider. We've got BigCommerce, which is our e-commerce um, software, software. And we've recently, uh, all of us uh, were sort of touched by the, the SAP um, implementation as well. Um, and with the library systems project, we implemented four new systems. So the important thing is all these systems somehow need to interact with each other. And the underlying thing throughout all of this is, is data. There's source of truth data within all these systems, and that's why they need to interact with each other. So if I just take it back a slide, SAP is the source of truth. It's, it's the record for all of our HR data as well as our financial data. Um, the catalogs, Alma and AdLib, they are a source of truth for published and unpublished data. Um, and the same goes with things such as uh, Rosetta, which is uh, for our preservation, our digital assets are stored there, and Razor Edge, for instance, for our custodians as well. So APIs help us to solve problems by reusing, and that's the key term. It's about reusing data from these applications to enhance or create new applications. So I thought it, the best way to illustrate this is sort of with everyday problems that we face here at the library. Um, so a problem might be you want to migrate over 10,000 records from another source to the library catalog. And if anyone from DQSS is here, they're probably going to have a heart attack. But this is a common problem that, that, that we face. Some possible solutions are we can manually copy and paste all those 10,000 records um, from that source into our catalog systems or we can import that data from those source systems using APIs into AdLib or Alma. So 
So if we think about solution two, which is the APIs, things always seem to start in spreadsheets these days. So um, if we think about the spreadsheet having all the, the rows of the data, we can then use a script or a tool to be able to read all of that. So um, Mark Edit is uh, one of the tools, for instance, to, to, um, to read things from a spreadsheet um, in, in Mark format. Um, and then once that's been written, you can use APIs from each one of our uh, vendors sort of um, supported um, APIs. So Alma, it's got a bibliographic API where you can batch import records. Um, and the same with AdLib as well. So this is one way that we can have a solution, which is sort of an API-driven solution. The next is another problem that we've faced more recently is um, implementing sort of the, the, the user experience around our digital images and having a rich experience for our digital image viewer. And this digital Im image viewer needs to be able to integrate with a lot of our source systems. So one of the possible solutions is to copy all that information from the source systems into the viewer, or we can use APIs to do a live lookup. And I'll show you what this looks like. So here is our collection viewer. And many of you may not know, though, it's using lots of APIs. It's using the Rosetta API to show these digital images. And it's also, if it's depending if it's published or unpublished, it's using the AdLib or the Alma APIs as well to show the descriptive information that's down the bottom. And the reason we can do this is um, each product that we've that we've got has got a range of APIs that are available, and that's actually something that we look for as part of our procurement is to make sure that there is an integration component with these. For Rosetta, these are just some sample APIs that I showed. Um, more recently around the solutions, it's, there's a get images type API which allows us to download images pro, pro, programmatically. Uh, we can upload images as part of our ingest workflow. We want to be able to upload a lot of our um, digitized content. Um, but also making sure that if people are downloading images, that you also check those access rights as well. For both the catalogs, AdLib and Alma, it's about trying to download the metadata. Um, that's specifically the, the descriptive metadata. And also importing, doing sort of batch import um, operations as well. So looking at the collection viewer, the, we use the get images API, and that's, it needs to use a file ID. Um, then if it's uh, published or unpublished, we use those identifiers, which are either the reference code out of AdLib or the MMS ID out of Alma. So, if applications could talk in English, this is probably what they'd say. Collection viewer will say, what's up? Um, then Rosetta would respond back. Um, and then the collection viewer would say, I heard you have some images. So this is where we start seeing what type of services are, are available from, the, uh, from Rosetta. And Rosetta would then respond back and say, well, I can, I've got images, but I need to see your, your, your key first. And the collection viewer should have a key. And that's the thing. It's, it's about access. It's making sure that we've got the right access to, to those digital assets in Rosetta. Once Rosetta verifies, then it says, what are you after? And then that's where we send through the, the IE, which is the album ID, for all these images. And Rosetta will then respond back and says, and will say, yeah, I can give them to you individually or package as a whole. And then we respond back to say we want them packaged. But there is protocols that's underlying all of this, and I'll just take you qu through that quickly. At the very beginning, the, when the collection viewer says, what's up, it's really seeing if it can communicate with Rosetta. And if Rosetta responds back, Rosetta will respond back in a type of language that the collection viewer can speak to. The next is once they've established that they can talk to each other, they will make sure that you are authorised to actually talk and get uh, specific services from Rosetta. So that the important thing there is about the authorization and access, that you are the right person that can, um, and you have access to those. Then after establishing that you, are, you have the right credentials, it's about, okay, now I want to use the, the Get Image API. I want to download images. 
and that's where all you, you'll send through the album IDs, and eventually um, it's called um, content negotiation. So that, that's where you can download um, these as huge data sets via different mechanisms, either um, XML files, uh, JSON for the technical uh, metadata, um, but also sort of as, um, as huge downloads for the, for the actual images themselves. So those were just some examples of how we use APIs here at the library, and I think um, because it's, they're so pervasive across not just business but um, our everyday lives, the Internet of Things is a, is a really hot topic that's um, uh, around these days. It's, it's about everything being connected and everything being connected to the Internet. So um, we've got... If you walk into JB Hi-Fi, you'll, you'll find that everything from light bulbs, they're connected, fridges... Um, I don't know, there's an image of a bed there, but I don't know why a bed would be connected. But um, you have a whole range of things which are connected to the internet. Now, the main things here are because there's data, data that's being pushed around, and you can then act on that data. And I'll show you a quick example. Um, in your smart home, in your, uh, you've got devices. If you, have a, if you have a tablet, you can control through APIs your air conditioning, and you can do that remotely. You can also see if you have, I guess, security cameras around the house, um, you can see the different cameras, um, and those are all done by APIs. And you can also access your fridge if you know that you have to restock some groceries as well. So there's some APIs that are really becoming part of everyday life as well. A really cool one um, is that I still play with. is It's a website called If This Then That. It's ifttt.com. And you don't need to know how to program or script. Um, and the way that it works is based on that logic. If um, you have an Instagram or if you take an Instagram picture, for instance, and I'm looking at this spotlight over here. Um, sorry. Um, if you've taken a picture on Instagram, then I want to automatically drop all that into my Dropbox account. And you don't have to do anything. So as soon as you snap that, it'll upload straight to your, your Dropbox. Um, there's another one. If, if you're close to home, then... You, sh you can direct message someone to, to let them know that you're arriving. So there's lots of ways that we can uh, play with these recipes. We can create our own recipes as well. So what are some principles for APIs? I think the main thing is they need to be accessible. Um, the data needs to be accessible, either through open access or through um, some type of um, authorization. It, the, the main thing is the data then needs to be structured and interchangeable. And that's so different systems can talk to each other. Um, documentation is, is, is key as well for data. Communication needs to be agreed via a protocol. There's lots of different API protocols out there, but it essentially means that uh, if two systems want to speak to each other, they need to agree on how they're going to speak. Uh, reliable means that when uh, one system tries to see if another system's available, it's always uh, reliable. And documentation as well. I know I was going to talk quickly about linked open data, but I think that's a whole session in itself. But um, in terms of linked open data, it still uses the principles of data, but um, I guess, uh, as the name implies, it's, it's, it's open. So there, there is a reuse function for linked open data, and that could be under uh, Creative Commons licenses, for instance. Um, it's also structured using identifiers. So uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who has, um, I guess he's a father of the web, he had a, a view of how we might be able to um, connect all the different web pages and web resources with each other, and it's via using um, these type of identifiers. Um, and getting into the, the depths of linked open data, you start looking at the way they structure um, what they call triples. And again, that's a, the way, a way that you might describe um, uh, me, for instance. Uh, Meta is a member of the State Library. So that is a triple. Uerometer is, is a person, is a member of. That's a kind of what they call um, a predicate. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's, it's an association with the final thing, which is the object, um, state library. So it's important that linked open data follows these type of uh, principles so, um, uh, to make data more reusable. Um, the... The main thing is it also needs to be able to be linked to other uh, data sources and data sets. And you can also access linked open data via APIs, direct download 
for what they call endpoints as well. So now what? Um, I guess it's about if, if you are interested and you can think about different ways you can use APIs, um, it's about building your capabilities in, I guess, librarianship. Data science and data librarians is, a, is a, an emerging area. Um, and there's a lot of great, if you've seen the different online um, MOOCs, online courses, um, if you want to delve into data science, that's, uh, that's a good area. As well as um, lynda.com, I guess. It, there's good tutorials there as well. Um, scripting and programming, just get your hands dirty, I think. Um, there's lots of great beginner uh, courses for scripting. Um, and tutorials. Tutorials are, are really good for, I guess, this type of technology. Tools, um, ifttt.com. Um, that's the website I showed previously. If you wanted to start playing with APIs and seeing what they look like, REST is one of those protocols that I mentioned earlier. Um, and you can download clients and software. Um, but then if you wanted to interrogate the data, you've got um, what they call these, these viewers for the data. So because it's structured, it uses XML, but it also uses JSON as well. Um, and finally, vendor websites. If you've got products that you know that you want to be able to integrate with, jump onto the website and see if they've got any APIs available as well. So I guess the, the main takeaway here is it's about rethinking the way that you would solve a problem. It's not about um, really trying to be um, use APIs without a purpose, but it's about rethinking the way that we'd solve a problem and try not to use manual methods and look at other ways um, that you can do things using computers and data and APIs. So some questions that you can ask yourself is, what data is available? What systems do I need to be able to pull data from? Um, are there any APIs available? So again, jump onto the, the vendor's websites. Um, try to see if you can use computers to do things rather than the manual copy and pasting. And if you're still trying to build your capabilities in this area and you're not a programmer, there's a lot of tools out there. So just doing a bit of investigation into those tools.